I put for our title today, I'm calling this Biblical Leadership, a Trinitarian Approach. And I know on the official handout, it just says Biblical Leadership, but more, the more I reflected upon this and just Biblical values and ideas, um, Biblical is a weighted term. It's something that I think that we use in the church um, that is kind of like our nuclear weapon, that we say, look, when we want to say that we're right and our views are right, uh, what better way than to get God on our side to say why we're right? And so uh, as I thought about the models for leadership and um, I was constructing a biblical model, model for leadership, I realized that I needed to uh, be a little bit more humble in my approach. And I would encourage us all to be a little bit more humble in our approach because I think that there are lots of biblical models for leadership. And so this is just one biblical model for leadership. And as you read other people who are Christian influence leaders, and as you think about your own models of leadership, I want you to think that, think that there are several models out there. Um, and I'm just giving you one, one perspective, one take on that. I'm calling this a Trinitarian approach. A, a common way to think about leadership is uh, from a biblical perspective, is people will go to someone like maybe Moses, or you go to Nehemiah, or you go to Paul, or Jesus. I even brought a couple books. Um, so, um, so uh, you know, if you want to talk about biblical leadership, I have J. Oswald Sanders' classic, Spiritual Le Leadership, which is a great book on models of leadership and reading spirituality on it. Um, you've got um, the passionate visionary leadership lessons from the Apostle Paul. Um, actually, not so sure about that. I'm not sure Paul was the best leader in the world, but uh, and we've got Jesus on on leadership. So there's going to be all sorts of models of leadership out there. And one of the most popular ones, of course, for Jesus is servant leadership. We like to talk a lot about servant leadership in the church. I'm not going to talk to you too much about servant leadership today because I think there's plenty out there to talk about uh, when it comes to servant leadership. Uh, Greenleaf has the has the popular book that's based on Jesus's principles um, about servant leadership, and so there's plenty to read on that. One one small aside I would say with servant leadership is if you use the servant leadership model in your church, just be cautious with that model that we're not making people into servants so that we can lead them. Uh, so I think sometimes in the church we have a tendency to say, well, you know, serve Jesus, give your all for Jesus, and they do it at the, at the expense and, uh, of the sake of the church. And we really, as a servant leadership model, can sometimes make people into servants and not really leaders as uh, servant leaders. Uh, serve me, serve my church, serve my values, serve my ideas. And so it's a great model servant leadership is, but I think it's also a model that is often misused by people in positions of power to say, let's go and be servant leaders here at the church. And you reflect like, you know what, it's a great model, but I'm not sure the person in charge is actually using this model. Um, and so it's just, that's, a, that's all I'm going to say about servant leadership uh, in terms of that model, just a quick word of caution. Said today, well, I want to give you a different model, a Trinitarian approach. Um, I, I decided to go with a Trinitarian approach because the great thing about the Trinity is it consists of persons, uh, but there's also community that's involved in it. And it's a complex relationship, such a complex relationship that we can't even really adequately describe it in human terms. Like, well, there's one God and there's three persons. Like, well, is that three gods or is it one God? Or how does that all work? And so there's a complexity, a nebulousness that comes to that. And uh, I think with leadership, sometimes there is a complexity and nebulousness that we don't, well, we know it works. And we have ways to, we have models to describe that. But one reason why there's such a proliferation of leadership books out there is because uh, no one has quite hit it on the money in terms of exactly what leadership looks like. And so we're always capable of learning what leadership looks like. Uh, in our own community settings, leadership is a dynamic. In order for there to be leadership present, you have to have at least two people for leadership to occur, right? You have to have at least a leader, and you have to have at least a follower. Now there's different ways that that relationship can look, at, look like, but if you only have someone following, that's not leadership. And if you only have someone leading, that's not leadership. You have to have at least two people. The Trinity doesn't work if you only have the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. The Trinity only works when there's a Trinity. And so uh, just taking seriously this idea of leadership and playing with this idea of leadership. And again, there's a lot of different ways to describe leadership. 
Um, Joe Maxwell describes it as influence, which is a nice model. Anyone that you're influencing is who you're leading automatically uh, with that. But again, it, it requires a couple people um, as well. The, the other thing um, that's interesting with leadership is um, to lead, uh, there's in some ways there's something inadequate even about the name leadership as we as you explore models because I think for leadership in order for me to lead you uh, I have to be in front of you and I have to be guiding you but as we explore models of leadership you discover there's a lot of different models out there for leadership there's coaches the guides on the side who aren't leading directly uh, there's people that are that are leading from behind or leading from the side. there's a lot of different directions that we can actually lead from and, uh, but leadership, I think, at the core idea of the term, seems to imply that you're always in front of everybody. And I don't think that that always has to be the case uh, for leadership as well. So uh, let's get into the three parts of the Trinity. First of all, we have Christ-centered leadership. Uh, and when, we, when I think about leadership, I think that this is one of the most important aspects of leadership, and that it's Christ-centered. We have to take seriously, there's a lot of different leadership books out there, a lot of different leadership ideas, and there's a lot of great ideas there. And so this is meant to complement those ideas, not to contrast or say that they're wrong. But in order for us to be Christian leaders, we need to take seriously that we are Christian leaders. And if we're Christian leaders, that means that we need to be Christ-centered leaders. After all, Christian means to be Christ-like or to be Christ-followers. It's interesting, in, in the book of Acts, uh, we get this. This is a nickname that the people of Antioch say, those, those Jewish Gentile people that are meeting in the synagogue that, that we've always called Jews or proselytes, that's what we've always called them. There's something so different about them that we're going to name them Christians. And, and one of the questions I want us to ask ourselves when it comes to our leadership is, does our leadership in the church look distinct enough that people outside of our community, not insiders, because we all know what we're supposed to say, but do outsiders look in at our leadership style and principles and say, that, that, that's Christian leadership, that is distinct, that is Christ-centered. Uh, are we leading in such a way that people outside of our community recognize our distinctiveness? Um, and, and this label Christian by the people of Antioch helps to teach us a bit of that lesson, that they saw something so fundamentally different that a group that had been traditionally associated with Moses and the synagogue, they now are saying, no, they're not the Jewish people anymore. They're not followers of Moses. They're Christians, Christ followers of leadership. Uh, we can take seriously the call that Jesus says to his disciples at the opening of the gospel, particularly Mark, of follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. As Christ followers, uh, are we putting Christ at the center? Um, as I've already said, a leader requires a follower. The other side of it is if we are putting Christ at the center, if we're taking seriously that he is the leader, guess what? That means you're not in charge. I'm not in charge. Right? Churches that put pastors in charge, ministries that put CEOs in charge, um, if Christ isn't in charge of them, then it's not Christian leadership. Fundamentally, the Christian leadership is taking seriously the claim that Jesus is Lord. We say often, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we even see like in the opening of Paul's letters, he calls himself a servant of the Lord. Uh, but how, how seriously do we take this title? Lord or kurios, that literally means master. Servant is literally a slave. That means when we proclaim that Jesus is Lord, we're saying he owns us. He has total control of our lives. As Christian leaders, we need to make sure that Christ has total control of our leadership, that we are following him, and that the choices we make are choices that he wants us to make, not choices that we think are important for ourselves or us. And it's hard, particularly as you have people begin to follow you, uh, it can be difficult uh, to distinguish between people following you and your great ideas and following Christ and pointing people to Christ. Um, this gets connected to if we're Christ-centered um, and we think about Christ as a servant, the Lord, uh, that Christ is really in charge, we can also think about this um, in terms of our duty to be humble followers of Christ, right? 
Uh, there's a humility that comes. We, we don't tend to, uh, to talk so much um, about the humility that's required of a Christian leader. And it becomes increasingly difficult to be humble when you have people that are always telling you how great your ideas are. Or maybe they don't tell you how great your ideas are. You just know how great your ideas are because you look out in your church and you've got lots of people listening to you. What kind of ego trip do you get on when you have 100 people listening to you? What kind of ego trip? My church, my pastor, uh, we have uh, somewhere between three and 5,000 people that, that listen to my pastor or my wife or the other pastoral team on a Sunday morning. Like, no matter what we say, like, there's ego that gets fed into it. Really? So, so what you're saying is God gave you the message for these 3,000 people to hear, and they only needed to hear that message on this Sunday. Go to a church of 10,000, 20,000. I think this works in a church of 100. Really? My Sunday school class, I have, I have about 50 people in my class. Really, Carl? That lesson, that was God's given lesson for them. Hello. Um, so, uh, humility is key for leadership. And it becomes increasingly difficult to not be humble with the more people we have following us. Uh, but one of the keys to that humility is, is also remembering that leadership ultimately lies with following Christ. Now, to get ourselves uh, back to the classic race of what would Jesus do? Uh, how would Jesus lead? What does Jesus have for us to do in this community? Um, connected with this law as being Christ centered is the body of Christ. Um, that if we're Christ centered, that means our community is Christ centered, that we are part of the larger body. If we begin to lead and we begin to see growth in our ministry, it's tempting to say, look, this is amazing. Look how much I'm contributing and growing to the body of Christ, right? It's hard to argue numbers. But back to this idea, if Christ is leader, uh, we can clearly say that if I'm following Christ, I'm contributing to Christ who's the head of the body, and therefore the body is growing because of my efforts. But when we take over leadership, we may be growing the body of Christ, but we may not be growing the body the way that we think. We may actually be growing a tumor. And we may, have, we may look and say, look at all these successful, connected people into the body of Christ. See how they're growing, how they're healthy. We're seeing explosive growth. But if we're the leader of that movement, we're not growing the body. We're not making it stronger. We've created something that needs to be dealt with, treated. And I think that particularly in today's age of numbers and growth, uh, if we forget that Christ is the leader, I think we have a serious warning for ourselves of whether we are growing a healthy body of Christ or whether we're growing a tumor within the body of Christ. Um, the other side with the body of Christ is that uh, it, part of leadership is nowadays is talking about networking. When you guys read the starfish and the spider, you're going to hear a lot about networking and the importance of networking and the and things like the importance of social media, that it's not just about meeting more people, it's thinking about interconnectedness. And as a church, we're already naturally an interconnected people because we are all part of the same body, the body of Christ. The things that I do affect you, and the things that you do affect me. Uh, it's hard to see maybe because we're in different communities, different churches, but when, we're, when you're in a small group, when you're in a Sunday school, when you're a church, you can see how, uh, how leaders act affects the community or how the community acts affects the leaders. So that there's an interconnectedness that happens with that. And so um, taking seriously this idea of the body of Christ. It's also important that when we think about the body of Christ and Christ-centered leadership, that as Paul uses the metaphor, um, I love the first Corinthians one because he talks about the, the, the inglorious parts, the embarrassing parts, the, the private parts is really what he's talking about. Like, and uh, you know, uh, when we think about the body, uh, maybe many of us want to be the mouth, uh, but uh, just as important to the mouth uh, is your bottom. Uh, what comes in has to come out, um, and in fact, the bottom might be more important. You could you could die from sepsis if things aren't properly treated. Uh, maybe we want to be the hands. We want people to see it, but uh, just as important to the hands are the feet to carry people places. 
Um, and so as leadership, one of the challenges, I think, for leadership when we start to think about teams is to think about the interconnectedness of the body of Christ, to think about what part we are as body of Christ, as well as what part other people are, and to be giving praise and credit to people who we don't necessarily naturally want to give praise and credit to, we just don't think about as leaders. Uh, but one of the keys, I think, to successful ministry is a ministry in the spirit of encouragement and thinking about the interconnectedness that when something that I do and may look like a win, uh, it's not just me that, that that is happening as a win for the kingdom. Uh, it's a win for the entire body of Christ. When someone else has a win, that that's a win for the body of Christ. When someone else is hurting in the church, that I should be hurting as well because we're all interconnected as the body of Christ. And there's strength that comes with that kind of networking. And as a leader, the more that we can leverage um, our interconnectedness through Christ, that we are all uh, part of his body, not part of my body, not part of my ideas, but a part of his body, the stronger our leadership can work. The second aspect of leadership <coughs> is spirit-led leadership. Um, connected to spirit-led leadership is this idea of calling. Uh, sometimes it's called vocation. Uh, this is also another distinct aspect of Christian leadership, is that as we explore our own leadership roles, as we look for people in our communities that, need, that we see needs being filled in our church, one of the fundamental questions we need to ask isn't, does this person have the right gifts and talents? We need to ask those questions. <laughs> but before we get to that question, we need to ask, is this part of God's calling on their life? Is this part of God's calling on my life? Christian leadership asks the question of calling. Um, of what is it that God's will, specifically, what is it that the Spirit has led uh, for our community? We see the model with Jesus and his baptism. Uh, Lakeview Christian Church. Hello! <laughs> um, so... With Jesus and his, his baptism, right, before he even starts his entire ministry, uh, we, it, the question sometimes comes up around Christmas time, like what would, would Jesus perform miracles when he was a kid? What kind of brat would he have been because he already knew the answers to the questions his parents would ask, the perfect child, all those kind of things start to come up. And one of the things that the gospel makes abundantly clear is that Jesus did not begin his ministry, did not even begin to perform miracles until the Spirit of God descended upon him at his back. Jesus, he could, he's God, he could have performed his miracles, but he doesn't. He relies on the power of the Spirit. Why would he do that? Because he's a model for you and I. We're not God. We have no capability of performing miracles. We need the Spirit to empower us and enliven us. And just as Jesus was empowered and enlivened because of the baptism of the Spirit, so we <coughs> get empowered and enlivened by the baptism of our Spirit of the Holy Spirit on our lives. Of course, as Christians, the Spirit enters into our lives when we make that profession of faith. We don't have to go get dunked in water and see a, a Spirit come down upon us. There are Christian movements that have places for uh, spiritual gifts and some of those reckonings. Um, I'm not here to get into a debate on when the Spirit comes upon people, uh, but uh, the point is all Christians can agree on is that the Spirit of God should come upon Christian leaders as Christ I had the Spirit come upon him at his baptism. And the crazy thing is when we are called by God, and when we, when, uh, and 1 Corinthians talks about that, that pos, uh, apostles, pastors, and teachers, they're appointed, they're called by God, and we're appointed by God through the Spirit. Um, but then we're, when we're Spirit-filled and Spirit-led, the crazy thing about when we're led by the Spirit is that the Spirit doesn't always lead us in the places that we think are natural for leadership. The very the first thing that happens for Jesus when he is Spirit-led is he goes off to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. That isn't really what I would have said. Would have been like, oh, that's, that's, that's the right plan on that one. Yeah, go, go get tempted by the devil, first of all. Second, like, the wilderness, really? That's where you go hungry? Like, none of that makes sense. And part of the things that, we, when we look at Jesus' ministry, there's a lot of it that doesn't make sense. That's counterintuitive, counterculture, even counter leadership. So, after Jesus has 5,000 people show up and he feeds them, he sends them away. After he has 4,000 people show up, he sends them away. After he performs miracles, he'll go away on a hillside and pray and send people away. He's constantly not gathering his crowds. He's constantly pushing away his followers, saying, 
no, you really don't want to follow me. Um, being spirit-led doesn't always mean that we're going to have incredible growth, incredible numbers. It doesn't even mean that we're going to be doing the things that other people would say, well, that's naturally what you should be doing as a leader. Um, now, I'm not saying go back and tell everyone to stop coming to your, to your churches, right? Uh, but, but we need to be attentive to, to the voice of God and the directions. And it helps sometimes, right? Part of the thing with leadership is the pain that's involved with leadership, the disappointments that come with leadership, the failures that come with leadership. And, and it's hard when we experience those moments, to say, we ask, why God? Why would you do this? And I think looking at Jesus' model of ministry, there's all sorts of failure that happens, all sorts of disappointment that happens, all sorts of misunderstanding that happens. And it's not just Jesus. Look, other Christian leaders, Moses has it, Paul has it. It's part of being a, a leader is to, to disappoint people. Um, and to be spirit-led and it helps us know that we're not the ones that are disappointing people, that, that this is part of God's plan for their lives and a part of God's plan for our lives. Uh, with being spirit-led as leaders, and your strengths book points out, we have natural gifts and talents. I encourage you, if you don't think that you have the gift of discipleship, don't become a disciple's pastor. If you don't think you have the gift of preaching, don't say, well, I, that must be what God wants us to do. Like, quoting, God's power is perfected in my weakness. That's true. God can perfect his power in your weakness, but I don't think that's how God normally operates. Um, and, it, and also that kind of mentality, uh, it starts to feed into our, our, our self-loathing side. Our, our inadequacy side. So, well, you know, I, I hate when I hear people, when I say, hey, that was a great ministry, great job. And the first thing people say, oh, it wasn't me, brother. That was all Jesus. Say, oh, really? I, I don't see it in here. I see you. Um, I, I see what he did through you. But it wasn't, if it was just Jesus, he would have shown up and he would have left. True, we're the body of Christ, so technically Jesus did it, but he did it through you and through me. We have natural gifts and talents. And we need to not be afraid to use those natural gifts and talents. We should not be afraid to seek out what those natural gifts and talents are. We should not be afraid to explore. We should not be afraid to encourage our people to explore what those are. We should not be afraid to use tools like strength-based leadership to help us to figure out what our strengths are and to find other people that can complement our strengths. Um, there is a lot of wisdom that comes with that. But that's not enough. That's not Christian leadership. That's leadership, which is good. Christian leadership acknowledges that not only do we have gifts and talent, but not only do we have talents, sorry, not only do we have talents, but we have spiritual gifts. Yeah, that the Spirit of God has blessed us, and the way I'd like to think about spiritual gifts is that God supersizes our natural gifts and talents. Sometimes, at this point, you're like, you've been doing ministry for a while, it can be very difficult to discern when you take a test like that, which part was naturally you and which part God has been working on for years to change and hone your life, that, that you have been blessed by the Spirit of God for years. And we need to be attentive not only to our natural gifts and talents, but we need to be attentive to how the Holy Spirit is gifting us and gifting our people and ask the questions of spiritual giftedness in our lives um, as well. Also connected with being Spirit-led people are being people that have the fruit or the virtues of spirit. One of the keys to leadership, Christian leadership, is character. Now, it's pretty clear nowadays that you don't have to have quality character and be a leader. Like, we've got all sorts of scandals in our country right now about people who have failed in their character and yet are leaders in our country. And this isn't a news story. This isn't a Democratic Republican story. This is a story of, of character failure. That, have, that has been going on uh, probably since the beginning of time. I mean, you can look at even think about the story of Moses and Pharaoh. Right? I'm going to kill all the Jewish babies. That doesn't really scream guy of good character, but he's the leader. Um, you can, uh, particularly if you're living out your natural gifts, your natural talents, uh, you can be a great leader. I can be a great leader. But the difference of whether we are great leaders and whether we are Christian leaders 
isn't just that we're people of a good moral character, good moral fiber, but that we are transformed and renewed by the Spirit of God living inside of us. That when people see our lives, we are exhibiting the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, that, that from the virtues that the Spirit creates inside of us, we make the right choices, we do the right things. Not because we say, oh, well, that's clearly, if I make this choice, uh, my, my building program is going to grow because uh, people see that I'm someone of integrity and that, that they can give money to my church and so they know I'll spend it wisely. We don't think about the ends. Uh, we think, we ask God, change our lives, change who we are. May I be the kind of person that you want me to be. And when God transforms our lives to the spirit, people will see that and recognize it. And that's what, as Christian leaders, we're trying to help people become Christ-like. That's kind of one of our main things. And as, if, if, as leaders, if we aren't people of godly character, which we can't do on our own, we have to have the Spirit working inside of us, then we can't be Christian leaders. And this happens, you get away from the whole tension between works and faith, uh, which I know is out there for a lot of people, when we recognize, we just ask God, God, transform, change my life. Let me live out Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Let me have those virtues. Uh, let me do good things because you have made me a good person. Not because of anything I've accomplished, but because the Spirit of God is inside of me. Connected with this as well, with the last thing with being Spirit-led, is taking seriously, we call them Holy Spirit all the time. But we don't think about what holy means. Uh, holy, in the most simple terms, just means to be set apart. As churches, as leaders, we're always looking for ways to distinguish ourselves. Right? Um, particularly in today's marketing, what is the thing that makes you stand out from everybody else? We're always asking that question. As Christians, as Christian leaders, as Christian churches, what makes us different is the presence of, presence of God in our lives, the Holy Spirit in our lives. And what's cool about, if we take seriously the notion of holiness, is what holiness means is I am set apart to God. What that does not mean is I am set apart from the world. So often as a church, we look for ways of how we are set apart from other people. Look at how I'm different from you. Look at how my choices make me different from you. So I'm more moral than you. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't chew. I don't go to rated R movies. I don't know what your list looks like. Uh, maybe or nowadays, be like, uh, those don't tend to be the popular categories. It tends to be, look at how much I've committed to social justice and helping out the poor and looking for the disenfranchised and the needy. Look at all the ways of how I'm making good moral choices and impacting for justice in my community. Unlike you. Right. So often our ideas of holiness and separation is we look for ways that we separate ourselves out from other people. Um, Romans 14 to 15 takes on this idea when Paul starts to talk about to, to the church, the Jews and Gentiles in that community, they're looking for ways that they can separate themselves off from the rest of the community. Um, a lot of it for the Gentiles is we're different from the Jewish people because we don't follow the law. The Jewish people, we're different from the Gentiles because we follow the law. And honestly, if, if you eat kosher food, you don't eat a lot of stuff. Like that food habit automatically separates you from everyone. I don't eat bacon. People think I'm crazy because I don't eat bacon. I think you're all crazy if you love bacon. My whole family loves bacon except for me. Uh, sometimes my wife makes it in the microwave and I open up the microwave and I get this unpleasant smell of bacon in the morning and I hate it. I've just separated myself from many of you by my eating choices and habits. <laughs> it's, it's, there's all sorts of ways to separate ourselves. These are external ways that the, the church in Rome, that we often uh, will separate ourselves. And some of them are good. You know, so we should have a commitment to the poor and social justice. Those are all good things, uh, but they aren't what define us. They aren't what distinguish us. What distinguishes us as the body of Christ, as Christian leaders, is the spirit of God in our, in our lives. That we are separated to God. And there's a different directionality to that. There's still a division. If we are claimed with God, if we're sacred to God, that means we are, we're not part of the world. That's true. There is a division happening. But what's great is when we start to think about holiness as being separated to God, towards God, the directionality of it as leadership, we're no longer pushing people away. We have the opportunity to draw people towards God as well. 
as we crave and seek holiness in our lives, it's an opportunity for us to draw people into the holy presence of God. And so holiness is absolutely important and vital. And, and having a commitment to holiness and having a commitment to the Holy Spirit in our lives is absolutely important and vital. But our commitment is a directionality towards God and separation to God so that we can invite people and encourage people to join us in his presence and to be transformed by his presence. The challenge with that as well is when we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, so I'm sl slipping into members of the Trinity for a moment. Uh, so we'll go back to Jesus for a moment. Is when Jesus draws people to himself, he hangs out with sinners and saints. People get it wrong about Jesus that, that they think the religious leaders were mad at him because he hung out with sinners. They could have cared less if he hung out with sinners. Like sinners hang out with themselves all the time. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, um, all these sinners in society, they're hanging out all the time. Like the Pharisees and religious leaders, they're in their sinner space. That's what sinners do. They go and hang out and do sinful things together. But we are the synagogue. We are the people of God. The problem for Jesus, what gets him so hacked off, the religious so hacked off, is he has the sinners and saints hanging out together in his presence. And that's where the problem came in. That's why they got so mad at him. Uh, and so just because we are holy and separated to God does not mean that we're not going to have sinners in our community and presence. In fact, we should if we're modeling the ministry of Jesus. There's a problem if we look around and everyone's perfect or everyone's like us. We need to be like Jesus and to be having both sinners and saints in our community. And honestly, if that happens, you're going to have problems. There's going to be fights and arguments that happen. And that's, I think, actually a sign of help. The question when those happen as a leader is do you deal with those problems effectively or not? All right. Um, the, the last one um, is the father's father brain. You're going to see in the slide in a moment that I, I haven't quite come up with my good, like, think Christ centered, spirit led. The father one, I haven't quite gotten the next word that goes with it. So here it says father's reign. The next slide says Father's kingdom. So um, trying to get at this idea of, of God's rule in our lives. So we need to be Christ-centered. We need to be spirit-led, but we also need to make sure that, that we are under God's rule, that God's authority, God's reign in our lives. And that's a good thing. When we look at Jesus' mission as a leader, he proclaims his gospel, his good news to people, is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And there's a lot of different ways you can look at the question of what is Jesus' mission? What's the mission of the church? So I'm not saying that this is the only mission of Jesus or the only way to approach the mission of Jesus or the mission of the church. There's a lot of answers to this. Um, but one of the places we can go for Jesus' mission and vision is his opening gospel statement. This idea that Jesus' mission was to bring about the reign or the rule of God. The term for that in his day was kingdom of God. That meant that God rules or God is in charge. Jesus said, repent and believe because God is in charge. This was a radical message for people because in his day, they looked around and said, no, the Romans are in charge. No, the religious leaders are in charge. But they, God's not in charge. Right? And even in today's world, this is still a radical message. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. Because we look at the Roman world, it's easy to say, well, it doesn't really seem like God is in charge. And if he's in charge, he's not doing a very good job at it. Right? I have a few bones to pick with God, with some of the ways that he is ruling his kingdom. All right? And so uh, Jesus' message doesn't completely make sense for people as they hear it, just like it doesn't completely make sense, I think, in our lives, say that there's a disconnect between the rule of God. We theologians tend to call this the already, not yet concept of the kingdom of God and the rule of God. That even in Jesus, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, the Greek is ambiguous. You can translate it at hand or it's near. And depending on which way you translate that, it either means the kingdom of God's here and now or it's coming. And those are very different. And the Greek's ambiguous about that. And I think it's intentionally that way. Because as Christian leaders, it's our job to be bringing about the kingdom of God for people, but it's imperfect. It's, it's near, it's at hand. We may see glimpses of it, but it's never perfected. I was talking to one of my friends last night about this concept, and um, some of the language that I used, uh, he, 
he thought was a little bit too forceful. Um, and the idea, when you start talking about kingdoms and reigns, I, I said establishing the kingdom of God. I said, but is it really establishing it as a leader? Are you establishing the reign of God, or is it God doing it? That's a good question. It's a good point. It's a, it's a partnership. Like, in some ways, I can't establish the reign of God. Because that means, that's saying God's in charge. That's what reign of God, rule of God means. There's nothing I can do to make God in charge. Like, he's either in charge or he's not. What I get to do is I get to submit to him being in charge. That's what I do. That's what I encourage my people. As leaders, what we want to do is we want to encourage people to submit to God being in charge. And when we submit to God being in charge, the kingdom of God is established. But I didn't do anything. I just submitted to the reign of God. Uh, yet this is a bit counterintuitive for us because we're always wanting to do stuff, to create programs and ideas to make the kingdom of God be at hand. But Jesus' call, repent, and believe it's a call to submit to the lordship of God, um, to submit to his reign. And this is important for us as a church. We get so focused on heaven or so focused on people having a personal relationship with Jesus that we forget why in the world would I want to spend all of eternity with you uh, when I look at the church and it's a mess and I don't like the people in the church. We have the opportunity to be creating imperfectly the kingdom of God in our Christian communities so that people get a taste of what eternity is like. It's a taste. It's not the beginning of eternity, but it's a sign showing this is what it looks like for people to submit to the reign of God. And when people do, the world is a better place. People are better because we are following the will of God. Jesus was strategic in how he went about establishing the reign of God. He went around performing miracles. He went around teaching people. He went around having table fellowship with sinners and saints. He went around strategically and intentionally helping people to see the reign of God. He went around casting demons out of the land. It wasn't just a people thing. There's a spiritual battle that's involved, that we are in the realm that was under the control of sin and death, but now it is under the control of God. At least that's what Paul, how Paul describes it. Um, and so we need to be strategic as leaders to help people to be able to submit to the reign of God. As a vision, vision involves a destination. I think this is one reason why um, leadership, as I said, involves following. And I think one of the reasons why vision casting is so popular today is because you kind of, if you're following people, you kind of need to know where you're going. Right? If you don't know where you're going, if you don't have a vision, what do you do with the people that are following that you're leading? So, uh, mission's important. Uh, we need to know what we're about. So, it's important. Hey, we're doing the kingdom of God, but we need to have a direction to that. Uh, for Jesus, it's his call to follow me. It involves his notion of repent and believe. Again, um, just as I think we get holiness a bit wrong, I think we get repentance a bit wrong. Metanoeo means to change one's mind. Sometimes it's described as to turn around. We think about repentance as, I'm sorry for the sinful things I did. And when we repent, we focus on the sin. I did this bad thing. I shouldn't do it anymore. God, I'm sorry. But that's not really changing one's mind. That's focusing on the sin, on the problem. Repent and believe what Jesus calls isn't to focus on the sin, but it's to turn towards God and the kingdom of God. Repentance isn't about so much turning away from sin as it is turning towards God. And when we truly repent, it's not just, I'm sorry for what I did, and because you can turn away from sin in any direction. What Christian repentance involves is that I'm sorry for what I did, and we turn towards God and we begin to follow God, and we begin to trust. He says, believe, or trust in God, trust in the kingdom of God. And as community, Christian communities, as leaders, we help people to trust in God when they see the effectiveness of the kingdom of God in our community. It, God becomes trustworthy when he sees the difference that we're making in the lives of our community, in the lives of our congregation, in our own lives. It becomes something that we want to turn away from sin towards God. We want to believe in God because we're part of something bigger than ourselves, the kingdom of God. It's true to be part of the kingdom of God, we need to kind of, you need to have personal evangelism, we need to convert individuals, that's kind of part of it, but that's too small. 
We are asking people to join us under the reign of God, the rule of God. This is something that affects our community. It affects our world. Finally, Jesus uh, uh, and the model of leadership and what we see with this kingdom of God is that it needs to be something that is reproducing and empowering of others. As leaders, we want to be constantly reproducing ourselves and empowering others. Uh, we see this in Jesus's ministry. Just like Jesus cast out demons, he, he has the spirit of God come upon his disciples and they go out and cast out demons. Um, and he sends them out. What's cool about in Mark's gospel, after he chooses the 12, after he says, go out and share the message, the reason why Jesus feeds 5,000 people is because the disciples went out and evangelized and told people about Jesus, and when they came back, they brought 5,000 people with them. It wasn't Jesus' ministry that brought 5,000 people to his doorsteps the first day. It was the ministry of the disciples. He empowered others to do his ministry, and when he empowered other people to do ministry, 5,000 people showed up. So leadership involves empowering others, reproducing our effects on other people. But again, it's countercultural because after Jesus um, fed 5,000 people, he, he sent them away. Again. And Jesus' ministry ends up getting reduced down to the 12, and even they don't do such a good job towards the end, and he has to come back and remind them of what he was about and doing. Uh, ultimately, when we think about vision and mission, we can't help but go to Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Go and make disciples of all nations. Go, make disciples of all nations. Teach them what I've commanded you. Baptize them. You get the Trinity here. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. So I hope this has been a, a helpful, a useful reflection for you in terms of what Christian leadership looks like. This is a layer to add on to all the things that we're going to learn about leadership. We need to constantly ask ourselves, what is distinctive about Christian leadership. It doesn't mean that other leadership styles and principles are bad. I say, oh, we're gonna be Christian versus those bad secular people. It's asking how are we distinct? Taking and learning good principles that come from it. all truth. I believe all truth is God's truth. Maybe you don't agree with that. That's what I believe. Truth is God's truth. And we can look for God's truth in a variety of ways. And there's a lot of wisdom out there about what leadership looks like. And hopefully you're gonna learn a little bit of wisdom uh, from the books we're reading, from the people who are speaking to us, but we want to constantly ask ourselves, what makes this Christian? Not so that we can put a label on it, but so that we know that in our own lives, that we are being Christ followers, that we are raising up in our own communities, in our own churches, in our own settings, Christ church and God's <laughs> kingdom. So people say, yes, these people are followers of Christ. Thank you very much.